Thanks, Mark. Good to see you. How's everybody doing? How many of you ate this morning? How many of you are hungry? How many of you are hangry? What's your favorite food? On three, I want you to yell it out. No, I didn't say go yet. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa. You need to calm down, kids. On three, shout out your favorite food. One, two, three. Good. Throw all that in a big pot, man, and you have some jambalaya thing going. I bet that would be good, wouldn't it? I love this series. Food. Feast of famine. You love food. I love food. I love God. I love food. God loves me. God loves food. He really does. He created it. You look cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation. What do you see? Food. It starts in the garden. It starts in like verse 4. It starts out, he, he, he starts creating plants to reproduce after themselves so that we can eat. And then all the way through, you see feasts and you see banquets and you see memorials and ceremonies. And, and then you see Jesus and you see food in the Gospels and you see, you know, food to make people happy and food when people are grieving. And then at the very end of the book, when it's all said and done, you see this great wedding supper of the Lamb where all the believers that love God throughout all of the centuries and decades in history are going to be sitting at a big banquet table. And what are we going to be doing? Eating. Oh, it's going to be good. And I think there's going to be food from every ethnic group of all time. It's going to be awesome. I think it's going to be the best food we've ever had. And, you know, food is, you know, is romantic. Some of you are nervous, like, right now. You're like, (laughs) sensual, too. (laughs) Where is he going? Think about that. I've been married. It'll be 35 years in September. 35 years. Yeah. But you know where it started? Over food. It started after a romantic dinner at Taco Bell. Nothing says love like a seven-layer burrito. And I'm telling you, when I had that burrito, we got in the car, man, and I had all that warm, gushy feeling and emotion going over me. And I thought, you know what? Now's the time. And I said, hey, I just want to tell you something. She said, what? I said, I love you. And I don't know if it was the stuff that was drooling out of the side of my mouth that she kind of went, oh, I don't know. It worked, though. We got hitched five months later, and almost 35 years later, started at Taco Bell. Have I been back? Nope. <laughs> nope. I ain't getting away with that kind of stuff. Think about this. Um, there's, a, there's a Korean caricature, and uh, if you just pull it up, and one of our sisters from Korea um, came up to me after a service and said, do you know that your name in Korean means meal. (laughs) Bob means meal. I investigated a little further, and it also means rice. So if you say, (laughs) na pop moko isa, in Korean, you're saying, I'm eating Bob. (laughs) Which I don't recommend, okay? But there's my connection with food and Korea. Thank you, sister. Think about the power of food. Think about how our bodies are designed to use food, to digest and turn whatever we eat into energy for fuel, for our use. Think about the power of food to turn enemies into allies, to also keep your heart right in an adversarial relationship. Think about the wisdom of Proverbs 25, verse 21. What does it say? And these are one of those verses that I say, I call them kind of, yeah, right verses. Because when you're reading them, they're kind of cool. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's good. I'll underline that. But if you ever have to bring it into reality, I mean, think about this. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. This is your enemy's. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. So he uses food and restoration here. Now, when the, the, the heaping 
burning coals on someone's head. It means you're doing one good deed after another, and the end result of that should be some embarrassment on their part and some conviction that would lead them to repentance. You know, it's pretty hard to have a bad attitude to the person that's actually feeding you. Isn't that right? I mean, I mean, think about it. If you're feeding me, you are not my enemy. If you're feeding me, we are friends. No, that's the truth. And I think there's something really, really powerful here. You know, um, it, how many of you had somebody that doesn't like you? <laughs> oh, geez. What did you do? <laughs> wow. I think food's the answer. I think if there's somebody that doesn't like you, I think you just go tell them, I think you need to take me out to dinner. I, I think it would help our relationship. If you take me out to dinner, I think it would be well with our souls. It's true. I think there's something restorative about food. We were on vacation a few years ago at our favorite place in eastern Washington called Lake Chelan, which is kind of a smaller version of Tahoe, but it's beautiful, man. It's blue. It's awesome. And we had this timeshare, and we had a, a, way too many people there that night. And the, the, the timeshare right next to us had some people that we didn't know, but, you know, you see them because they were at the same, same time slot. And so we had about 20 people in our little unit, and we were playing gestures. Man, we got into this thing. I mean, we, and it got late, and it got loud, and then all of a sudden we heard on the wall. It's like, okay, oh, God, you guys are good. We to calm down. It's like 10.30, 11 o'clock, and, you know, so we dialed it down, but then it kept, kept ramping back up, you know, and we started getting loud again, and then again, there was a, it's like, okay, guys, we have got to dial it down. It's like 11.30, and then same thing happened. We got amped up, I and mean, that's a fun game, you know, I mean, it's, you know, people get into it, and then all of a sudden, there was a knock at the sliding glass door, and there's these two big security guards, and it was like, whoa, Okay. Open the door. We're all sitting in there. There's no drinking. There's nothing wild like that going on. We're just going crazy over this game. The guy goes, hey, you know what, guys? Your neighbors have complained. They knocked on the wall, and you guys need to break up this little party. It's like 1130 midnight. We said, okay, we're sorry. It's like that. So everybody piled out. That was kind of fun. Went to bed, and I got really convicted. You know? Happens once in a while. You get, you get really convicted like, ah, oh, Really? I just felt bad. I thought, cause, and I knew them, and then they had their like, elderly parents that were there, and they had little kids, and, you know, and they were not happy. So you know, I thought, what do I do? So there's this pie shop that makes the, these homemade pies. And so I thought, I'm going to go get a blueberry pie. So I got this blueberry pie in this pink box, and I wrote, I said, I am so sorry for last night. We were so loud. Please forgive us. I hope this just, you know, makes things go better, you know. And, and I did. I groveled on this box, and, and I set it right outside their door, and then I left, and I came back. And when I came back, the guy comes out, and he goes, hey, man, you didn't have to do that. And he is falling all over himself with forgiveness, he goes, no, I didn't mean to make a big deal about it. You know, we just got elderly parents here and this and that. And you didn't have to do that. And so I said, no, no, it's okay. It's, it's, it's awesome. We get to talk them, get to talk them. We get to meet them. We get to know them. They live in our, in our area where I pastored, and their whole family ended up coming to our church. <laughs> now, I'll tell you, an apology will go a long ways. An apology and a blueberry pie? That'll go a long, 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 long way. So I, I, I think wisdom of Proverbs, Jesus talked about it in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Paul talked about it in the later chapters of Romans, you know, about doing good and feeding your enemy and doing this. So th think about the word restoration. Everybody say restoration. restoration. And food. And you know what I'm thinking? I, the more I delve into the whole food issue in the Bible, I'm not so sure emotional eating is a bad thing. Oh, no, I'm serious. I, you, you have emotions, right? Most of you. There's a few frozen out there. You have emotions. They spike. They go up. They go down. How many of you, a good meal doesn't like make it kind of feel better? I didn't say junk food. I didn't say, you know, sit down with a whole pie yourself and, you know, engorge yourself. I just said, I don't think emotional eating is a bad thing. After you pray and, you know, read your Bible and all that, then I, okay, yeah. 
think about the relationship with food in us. Think about the fact that God uses food to say something about himself. He talks about things like hunger. If you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you will be satisfied. He says, taste and see that the Lord is good. What's he doing? He's appealing to your senses. He's appealing to your taste but buds. He's trying to get you to make a connection between the very act of eating and who he is. What did Jesus say? I am the bread of life. He said, I'm the living bread that came down from up above, from heaven. Nourishes and satisfies your souls. God uses food to say something about himself, about his nature, about his creation, Did you ever think about how generous creation is? That here you've got thousands of years ago, God creates a place and creates a garden and creates plants to reproduce after themselves. And here we are thousands of years later and we are eating between 250 and 300,000 species of plants that are edible. I mean, we've gone to meat, 250 to 300,000 species of plants. Think about the creativity and the diversity of God, the imagination of God. There are 1,600 different varieties of bananas. Apparently, if you've seen one banana, you haven't seen them all. No, I want you to think about that for a minute. God could have made one banana that grew the same way, that looked the same all over the planet, but no, 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 no. God is so creative so imaginative, so incredible. He said, nah, let's go 1,600 varieties of a banana, at least that they know of now. We'll give them another 100, 200, 300, maybe 1,000 years. They'll discover maybe 1,000 more varieties of the banana. (laughs) Banana. I love bananas. There's over 50,000 medicinal plants 50,000 medicinal plants that they can connect the dots between what you eat and how your body heals and restores and rejuvenates itself. And only 16,000 of those have been tapped into. Still discovering. I think we're late to the party because we like drugs. Right? Pharma, money, all that kind of stuff. But God hardwired creation to restore itself and to restore us. That's a, good, that's a good thing, man. Some of you go eat some carrots today or something. <laughs> Creation's generous. We have 10,000 taste buds. Isn't that, that's exciting, man. When you taste something, you just, something goes on, and man, all kinds of firings go off in your brain, and your mouth gets all excited. And Aren't you glad that you have taste buds? Imagine if you had no taste buds. You tasted nothing. You'd be just eating like biscuits every day, dry biscuits. But no, God had to say, I'm wiring you with 10,000 taste buds so that all kinds of food and meat and sauces and and everything is just going to excite you. Isn't that exciting? (laughs) That's kind of geeky, but I I tell you what, I love my taste buds. I do, man. And, And I tell you, they fire the most on Thai food. I will tell you that. I've had it twice this week, man, and it's like, fourth of July in my mouth. I'm not even kidding, man. I think I'm joking. This is, this is godly right here. When was the last time you really appreciated your food? When was the last time you said, you know what, God? You created all this, and it's good. You said it was good, and it's good for me. And you, and you made it, and you created it so that I can enjoy it. And not alone, but you created it so I could enjoy it in community. I could enjoy it with other people. And in the eating and the sharing of meals, we would bond and we would connect in a way that wouldn't be possible. You know, in Ethiopia, it's a common practice for people to feed each other. That's awkward. (laughs) It's awkward, man. A grown man. It's... It's weird, but it's bonding. That's how you build trust. So if you don't want trust, you don't do that. If you want trust, you let them feed you. Ah. I mean, you think about the power of food and and what does food do? It opens doors and hearts for the gospel. 
All around the world, man, the way you treat food is either an open door or a closed door to the receptivity of what you have to say. Like if you're in China and you're discussing business over a meal, taboo. Bad news, man. You sit down and say, oh, I want to share, da, 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 and you start launching into it. Nope. Walls up. Hearts closed. They're not going to listen to what you say. That's a don't. You don't do that in that culture. What you do do is after you eat, you burp. That's true. It's complimentary. So whoever made you the food, when you rip run, yep, they, they smile. And my wife called me rude for all these years. <clears throat> now that is so rude. No, it's complimentary. I'm affirming what you cook tonight. It's true. I'm just telling you the truth here. India, you want conversations to open? You don't order a burger. Why? Because cows are sacred. You go in there asking for a cheeseburger? Mm-mm, not good. You go in wearing a leather belt or any kind of leather? Not good. Leather briefcase? Walls up. You're done. You don't get to first base with the gospel. They're offended. Japan, when you go to Japan, I'm believing some of you are going to go to all these countries that I'm talking about. You go to Japan and you stick your chopsticks straight up in the rice bowl? Bad, bad move, American. Bad move. You're basically... That is a sign of you're feeding dead people. So you sit down, you think you're being cute, stacking your chopsticks, and they're going, he's feeding dead people right now. Oh, let me talk to you about Jesus. <laughs> not happening. It's not happening. I mean, it's incredible, all the door opening that can happen. Now, why did Jesus eat with bad people? Because he loved them. And eating meals together was a sign of his love and grace. And, and that's why religious, uptight people didn't like it. What's he doing eating with sinners and harlots and drunkards? He must be a glutton. He must be a drunkard. If you get accused of that, you're eating something, right? You're drinking something. If they're accusing you of that, you're with the wrong riffraff people. But that's what, that's, that's what God does. He comes close. He invites. He invites himself sometimes. Want to blow somebody's mind? Invite yourself over to their house for dinner. Hey, how you doing? What have you been up to? Hey, I'm coming to your house tonight. What do you got? Be like Jesus. Invite yourself over. I'm, what do you tell? Nathaniel? Who's the guy in the tree? Zacchaeus. Close. <laughs> Zacchaeus. He said, come down from the tree. I'm coming to your house today. I guarantee they were eating. Think about all through Luke. All through Luke. Five all the way through 22. Eats with tax collectors, sinners at the home of Levi. He's anointed by a woman at the house of Simon the Pharisee during a meal. He feeds 5,000 in Luke chapter 9. Luke 10, he eats in the home of Mary and Martha. Luke 14, Jesus shares about the parable of large banquet in which he urges people to invite the poor rather than their friends. Luke 22, we read the account of the Last Supper. On the eve of Jesus' most trying time, most emotional time, a time of betrayal. Arrest, crucifixion. What's he doing? He's eating. Which maybe validates my point about emotional eating. If Jesus, we know he had anguish. We know that it was intense emotionally. But isn't it interesting that on, I don't know, what are you doing the night before, during the week of, that you're going to get totally betrayed, arrested on bogus charges, humiliated, spit on, falsely accused, all those things. Tell me what you're doing. Praying. Well, of course you are. What did Jesus do? He ate with his friends. You know what else he did? He served his friends. And he washed their feet. That's absolutely amazing to me. That's what Jesus did at the Last Supper. And it's called the Last Supper. It's not called the Last Community Group. It's not called the Last Bible Study. It's not called the Last Prayer Meeting. It's not called the Last Lecture. It's called the Last Supper. That's a big deal. John 21. Arguably, these are some of my favorite verses in the Bible. Because I, like you, sin. How many of you sin? How many of you sin this week? How many of you sin this morning on the way to church, in the car, with your spouse, 
Never. Always. <laughs> we sin. Is there anybody in here that isn't currently experiencing some level of brokenness and fragmentation? You're not? We have one. <laughs> Pastor Brandon, walking on water this morning. I was walking on water on my way to church. <laughs> Thanks for being a good model for us. <laughs> So we fail. Isn't that true? Let's just call it like it is. We fail. We fail often. We sin often. We try to get it right. We repent, hopefully, often. We walk in his grace, hopefully, often. We come to him in mercy, for love and mercy and grace. We resist the temptation to try to fix ourselves, which I believe is maturity. When you stop trying to fix yourself, when you start coming to him and let him come to you in a profound, loving, confrontative way. And we'll get to what that looks like. But, you know, what, what has happened here? Jesus has been crucified. He is raised from the dead. He makes his third appearance to the disciples. He has done crazy things already in the short amount of time. He walked through a wall where the disciples were hiding from the Jews out of fear. And he walks through a wall, which gets their attention. And they get very uptight. And he says, peace. You just calm down, everybody. Just chill. And they're just beside themselves until like three or four times. He says, peace. You know, it's going to be okay. And he does outrageous things like, you know, Thomas, I'm not going to believe it's him. Blah, 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 blah. You know, I'm going to, unless I reach in, touch that. You know, what does he do? You know, Thomas, reach in. Oh, my gosh. You know, and then what happens? Jesus goes away for a little bit. And now we pick up the story, and they're going to go fishing which is kind of crazy. You have an encounter with a risen Jesus who walked through walls, who tells you crazy things, who demonstrates things, and you're going to go back to an old way of life. And so you're going to see really kind of a manifestation, particularly of Peter, with brokenness. In verse 1, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. Happened this way, Simon, Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Canaan and Galilee, sons of Zebedee, two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. They said, we'll go with you. So they went out, got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. You know, when you look at Peter's emotional makeup at this point, I, um, it's not a stretch to say he's probably depressed. Uh, it's not a stretch to say he's, he's probably embarrassed. That, you know, I mean, as he's recalling his good intentions as he's recalling some of his, you know, pride and his arrogance and his machismo, you know, and he tells you, oh, man, I'm never going to let them take you. And even if I have to die and, you know, it just goes on and all this, you know, bravado and, you know, which is all great. But <clears throat> he rolls over and plays dead, basically. He doesn't live up to his own hype. And so he denied the Lord three times. You know the story. Don't even know him. Don't even know him. No, nah, I never heard of him. You ever been betrayed? How many of you have ever been betrayed? I mean, really betrayed. Somebody you thought was very close and they walked out on you. Or they walked out on you and said bad things about you when they walked out on you. Or they distorted the truth. Or they lied and slandered you and it wasn't even close. You ever had that happen to you? Doesn't feel good, does it? Didn't feel good to Jesus. And that's what Peter did. And so there's a temptation. And I will say this. You will face this as a believer many times in your life. When you feel stuck in spiritual progress, where you feel like you're not gaining ground, where you feel like, man, I'm praying, but not much is happening, or there's that spiritual lethargy that kicks in, or your, your failures have stockpiled, and, and you're, you're just not seeing wins and victories, and so there's this, ah, I don't know if I can go forward anymore, and so the temptation is to go back to what was familiar. You know, you can call it spiritual relapse, you can call it backsliding, you can call it whatever you want. But there's that temptation when things really, boom. And I would just say this, God leads you to hard places to bring you to the end of yourself, not so that you can go back, but so that you can trust him to go forward. That's always his will. And once again, I don't care how long you've been a Christian, I don't care how long you've been in church. I don't care how many times you've read the Bible. I will tell you there are multiple, multiple times in your future where you're going to feel like you are at the deadest of dead ends, spiritually emaciated, where you got nothing going. And that's where his grace needs to come in. Early in the morning, 
Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? I love that. Friends. (laughs) This is Jesus, the guy who walked through the walls, right? Raises dead people. (laughs) Friends, caught any fish? I don't know why that's humorous to me. No, they answered. (laughs) He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. (laughs) When they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. You know what I call this? I call this a redemptive reminder. Write that down because this is a reality that you see scripturally. This is a reality that I've experienced. This is a reality that if you pay attention, you you will experience. Redemptive reminders. A revisiting the place of previous failures. You've all failed. You've all said that. Except Pastor Brandon. (laughs) I'm done. I'm fired. Um... We've all failed. You, you would agree with that. Okay, yeah, I know. You just got excited with the hand raise. Um, so we've all failed. Now, this is what I know. Either when you look at your failures in the past, how many of you can look back and see some failures? Like right now when I say this, you can go, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You will either look, to, look at them through redemptiveness or judgment, which is why a lot of people don't want to go back to the past. So what we do is when our past hasn't been dealt with, and what I say is deal with your past or your past will deal with you. That's why a lot of people stay busy. That's why people keep the radio up or the CD or the MP3 or whatever is out there now. I'm like a little behind the times. But noise, sensory stimulation, sensory overload. Can't sit alone, can't be alone in a room by yourself with no stimulus because the past speaks. Redemptive reminders. This is good. This is, today, I believe this is going to set some of you free. Redemptive reminder. Where did Peter first doubt Jesus? Luke chapter 5. Jesus steals their boat, goes out a little from the shore, teaches a little Bible study. Then tells them, hey, launch out in the deep, catch some fish. Remember what Peter said? Oh, we fished all night. We've caught nothing. Which when you fished, I don't know how many of you are fisher people, but when I fished and you're done, when the day is done and you haven't caught anything, you're done. The last thing you want to hear is somebody say, oh, go back and throw it over there. Done, done. Save it for another day. It's over. No. Used all the lures, used all the bait, got a bad attitude, I'm hot, sunburned, gone. Leave it alone. So Jesus says, go, launch, go. Peter goes, "Ah," bad attitude, then he goes, nevertheless, at your word. (laughs) Get back in the boat, launch it out, set the nets down, and what happened? They caught so many fish, the nets began to break. What happens to Peter? The reality of who Jesus is and the miracle that just took place, converging with his bad attitude, doubt, and unbelief, he drops to his knees. He says, depart from me. I am a sinful man. That's a big dose of humility. So in light of that, what does Jesus do? Does Jesus move away from him because of his bad attitude and his immaturity? No. A contraire. (laughs) Jesus, don't know what that means, but it sounded cool. Jesus, Jesus comes close to Peter. And then you know what he says? Follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. So not only am I not rejecting you because you're immature and you got a funky attitude, I'm going to call you alongside me. And we're going to do great things for the kingdom. That's what Jesus does with failure. I don't know what you do with failure. I don't know what you do with your kids' failures or your relationships that you're in and when they fail. But I'll tell you what Jesus does. He doesn't move away. He moves close to. That's a redemptive reminder. Peter never looked at nets the same way again. Redemptive reminder. Then the disciple who Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord! (laughs) As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him. Okay, just pay attention now, kids. (laughs) It gets a little crazy here. 
It's the Lord. He wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off. Probably hot, probably humid. So he's down to his skivvies. Navy term, I think, right? Mike's looking the other way. Never mind. Probably isn't. Shorts. So what's he do? He, t- he puts on his outer garment, and then he jumps into the water. Now, you know when you go swimming, you don't put clothes on. You take clothes off. So Peter's, this is kind of nuts to me. And he jumps into the water. You know what I love about this? Here's what I love about Peter. He's all in. Peter's all in. It's the Lord. Ah! And he jumps in. He's all in. He's the same Peter as when Martha and Mary came and said, hey, the Lord's alive. The tomb's empty. Him and the other disciple ran, got to the tomb, and it says, and Peter went in. The other disciple didn't. That's saying something about Peter's character. He's a knucklehead, for sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, no. He's immature, for sure. But you know what? The dude gets excited about things, and he's not afraid to show it. And he's all in. Runs in the tube. Woo! Gets excited. Runs back out. Tells all the other disciples. He's alive. It's amazing. Has a moment of doubt. Does all this stuff. Now we're back to this scenario here. And yeah, it's, it's the Lord. Oh, put my clothes on. Jump in the water. Had a crazy thought. You want to know what my crazy thought was? Because really, why would you put your clothes on to jump in the water? I'm just wondering, is it possible that since Peter had walked on water previously, maybe he thought he would walk on water this time? I don't know. That's a stretch. It's speculation. It's possible, though. All right. He didn't think that was all that exciting. Well, forget it. I liked it. I got excited about that. Got my comfort cup of coffee here, just in case you bail on me. <laughs> you bailed on me for service. Gosh, I thought that was money. Verse 8, the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish. They were not far from the shore, about 100 yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals. Everybody say burning coals. Burning coals. There with fish on it and some bread. Another redemptive reminder. The only place you find burning coals is here And in John 18, verse 18, where did Peter first deny Jesus? At a fire. Where is Jesus calling Peter to? A fire. To Peter, you know what burning coals smell like? Shame. I believe that. I think Jesus brings us back to the previous places of failure to show himself in a different light than what we had experienced on our own. And so now here's the burn. Why does it say burning clothes? Why is it only the two places where he denies him and where he encounters Jesus? Because it's a redemptive reminder. He re-engages Peter right here at this place. You know, Peter's looking at that fire just going, oh, man, another fire. Uh, Trigger. That's a trigger moment right there. And Jesus loves it. Notice that who provided the food? Jesus. He either bought it or caught it. He provided the food. Who provided the fire? Jesus. Who provided the fish? Jesus. Who provided breakfast and served breakfast? Jesus. That's called grace. When Jesus does good things for you, not because you deserve it, just because that's who he is. That's his nature. Even in places and times of failures, those past things that you and I have that torment us, that cause guilt, cause condemnation, cause us to want to run away, you know, you know cringe moments? Let's call them cringe moments. You know, you're driving down the road, <laughs> it's a good day, flashback. Someplace you shouldn't have been doing things, shouldn't have done, caused a lot of wreckage, and you just kind of clench the steering wheel a little harder, and there's kind of a physical, oh. You ever have those moments? That's what he's after, those moments. That just means you're not free. Those moments are not redeemed yet. What's Jesus after with Peter? His past. He's after his failure. He's after his pride. 
He's, out, he's after everything. What does God want from you? Everything. Everything. Your past, your present, your future, your pain, your shame, your guilt, your condemnation, your good intentions, your bad intentions, your failures, all that wreckage. He wants it. It's redemptive. You know, I, I, I've had a couple of these. Man, I'm telling you, there were... This is just bad, man. Back in the drinking day, days, day. <laughs> I lied, sorry. Days. I did this thing where I'd get guys together and I'd say, let's do this, let's call it a zigzag. And Highway 99 up in Seattle, south of SeaTac, there was, I don't know, 20 bars. I said, let's just drink all of them. And I'm telling you, I remember going up there, post, and there were bad, you know, bad things happen at those places. And I remember going back up to visit Washington, driving down that road and just literally looking at different establishments <laughs> and just having recollections of just not good stuff and just going, oh, what a filthy dude. Oh. Now, make no mistake, Jesus isn't highlighting that stuff to shame me. He's, he's reminding me who I am, my new identity. And that was an old identity. And the new identity doesn't go there anymore <laughs> and doesn't do. And I tell you, I had one, I'm going to just share a horrible moment. So I get saved. I become a Christian. I get into ministry. I'm pastoring. A guy that I had witnessed to years ago and I worked for the airlines, um, you know, struggling with drugs and crazy stuff. We get a hold of each other. He starts driving an hour to come to my church. Okay. Great. We baptize him. You know, I love this guy. This guy is awesome. I didn't know he was younger than me. So I didn't know, you know, a lot of his friends and all that and went to different schools and everything. And so years later he goes, he goes, would you do pre-marriage counseling? And would you marry me and my, you know, fiance? I said, sure, absolutely. I'd love to. So we go through all that and we, we do his wedding at this big church in Bellevue. And, man, there was like 500 people there. I mean, it was, it was a good size. And so him and I, you know, and okay, now remember, okay, this is, this is not B.C. This is A.D. I have been a Christian for, you know, 15 years, whatever. So him and I walk up, you know, walk up, do, 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 stand there, boom. And the first person I see was one of those Let's just call it an unredemptive relationship. It was just not a good thing. The memory was horrible, bad, bad, crazy, sinful, anything else you want to say. And that, oh, this, you know, 500 people, man. That's the first person I see. I look at the person, they go. <laughs> I went. And I was visibly shaken. I mean, I'm serious. I, I mean, it was like, and my buddy leans over and goes, what's the matter? I said, oh. You know, and the people are lining up and everything, you know. You know. And so I, I told him the name. And he goes, you, you know? And tells the name. I said, yeah. He said, oh, I got to hear this one. I said, no, you don't. No, you don't. I was rattled, man. I, I, am re I was really rattled. Let's say it didn't end on a good note, okay? So <laughs> get through the ceremony. Go to the rehearsal. This person <laughs> comes up to me. What are you doing? <laughs> I said, well, a lot's changed. <laughs> a lot's changed. And I'm really sorry for anything I said, anything I did. And, and I begged for forgiveness because it wasn't good. They had a family and it was, all, you know, it was all good. But I said, I am not the same guy. And I humbly apologize. And, we, and, and it, was, it was good. But I'm telling you what, it so affected me. When I got home, LaDonna didn't go to the wedding. When I got home, I was home, hey, how you doing, honey? I come home, five minutes. She goes, what's the matter? I said, oh. And I told her the story. And I was, as hard as that was to go back to that place, God wanted me to go back to that place. Because there was unfinished business that had to happen. And the business got dealt with. I apologized, I repented, I made amends. It was good. It ended well. God did something there. I got to share my testimony there. So let's stand up together. That's, 
That's really what God wants. He, he wants to deal with your unfinished business. If you read the rest of the story, I, I, there's just some interesting things here. After, after the, the, the catch of fish, they count them and there's 153. 153 fish, which is kind of interesting because no other place do they number the fish. But they number the fish 153. You go, what's the significance of that? One of it, one of the significance of it is this, that early almanacs said that there was 153 ethnic groups. So Jesus is letting them see a picture of what the harvest looks like geographically. And the other thing I, I, I think, and this is just kind of my take on it, is that he wanted them to count their blessings specifically, not generically. And I want you to just think about how you pray and how you give thanks. When you, when you pray and when you give thanks, do you, do you do it more in a generic way? God, you know, thank you for my family. Thank you for my health. Thank you for this. Thank you for my food. Thank you. you know, that kind of generic thing. Or, or, do you, or do you specifically say, God, thank you. You let me live this amount of days. And I have relative good health. Do you know that my, my dad died at 39? He was 39 of a massive heart attack. So when I turned 39, you know what I did? I was looking over my shoulder. What were you looking over your shoulder for? The Grim Reaper. I'm serious. I was, I mean, that year was not a good year. My mom died at 57. Cancer. You know what I did at 57? Looked over my shoulder. You think I'm grateful? I'm 62. I, I know I look 42, but, you know, I... <laughs> I'm, this dude is thankful for, six, and I call it out, thank you for 62 years. I don't just thank God for my marriage. I thank God for 34 years and 0.7 months, <laughs> days and hours. Just go specific. All right, here's what I want to pray. I really felt as I was preparing this, I, I want you to just think about one area, and let's call it unfinished business in your life. Let the Holy Spirit just speak to you. Jason, if you could come on up here. I want you to just think of one area of unfinished business. I want you to think about that. The, the one thing that dogs you, that stalks you. Be it shame, condemnation. Maybe you've been betrayed. Maybe you are, are still stinging from the wounds of a betrayal. Somebody that said, we're going to be friends for life. We're going to be married for life. And they bailed on you. Why don't you just think about that one thing? Don't get preoccupied with too many things. Think of one thing. And specifically that whole deal of shame. That, that message that, that tells you over and over that what you did was so bad, it made you bad. You are bad. Why don't you think about that shame? or addiction. In Psalm 34, verse 5 says this, They that look to the Lord, their faces will be radiant, and they will never be put to shame. I tell you what, that is not in God's repertoire. Shame. Not there. So if you got it, it's not from him. So how many of you would say there's one area that you know of that God has been pressing into? Unfinished business that he really really wants to come to. Would you raise your hand? Slip it up. Hold it up, would you? And I would like prayer partners to come forward also and be ready for these people. And keep your hand up. Keep, just keep your hand. Lock the elbow out. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what Peter's issues were. Jesus would have still came to him. Would have still loved him. Would have still received him would have still encouraged him, would have still let him feel the weight of his own weakness so that he would depend on him. And you know, after Jesus deals with Peter's weakness and unfinished business, he challenges, he goes, high challenge, you read the rest of the story. Do you love me? Yes, I do. Do you love me? Yes, I do. Do you love me, Peter? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, Jesus is just challenging him. 
He asked him that three times because Peter, I believe, denied him three times. So Jesus is going right back. And you know what? History says Peter got it right. Peter let Jesus do what he wanted to do, and he became the pillar of the New Testament church. No, you don't see any more cowardice. You don't see any more braggadocious. You don't see any arrogance. You see a humble servant of Jesus building the church, doing signs and wonders and miracles, and teaching the body of Christ, as Jesus told him to do, feed my sheep. And so Peter did. So Lord, we lift up that one area of unfinished business. We humble ourselves. We raise our hands to you. We acknowledge that you see it and you know it. You're not intimidated by it. You're not threatened by it. Your grace wins the day. Your love wins the day. Your mercy heals that area. So I pray for every person in here in the name of Jesus. They would receive the grace of God in a new way and in a fresh way. I pray that they would not be afraid when they see those remnants of the past, but they would know that you have something to say in that moment, where they were, what they did, what they said, what happened to them. You're the healer. And so I ask you to continue to do your work of healing, wholeness, and restoration in the lives of every person in this room in the name of Jesus. And everybody said... Amen. So be it. If you need prayer, get on up here, church. I love you. Have a great week.